Hey guys, thanks for joining us on another episode of the You Can't Afford Me podcast. First, I got to say we're making history on the You Can't Afford Me podcast today. This is the first guest that we are interviewing at a distance. So this guest is not in Richmond, Virginia, and we're planning on doing a lot more of this uh, moving forward in 2024 with season two. Uh, but I had the opportunity to be on this gentleman's podcast last week, a couple of weeks ago and had a blast. I was like, man, we got to connect more. We got to talk more. Um, and said, man, I'd, I'd love to have you on the show. So this is going to be an entrepreneur talk for sure. Uh, today we got my guy Brent Stone on the podcast. Brent, how you doing today, buddy? Hey, Sam, I'm, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Fantastic, man. So first, tell the audience who you are and what you do. Yeah, my name is Brent Stone out of Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, I'm, I'm a married man. I've got two small kids, three and one. I don't sleep a lot. I like to have fun with them uh, when I'm awake, which is pretty much 22 hours a day. And, <laughs> right and that's not because you, I work. Too. I got a three and two. Bro. I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. It's not because I work too much. It's because I'm chasing the kids. Yep. So, um, it's just, you know, my son, he climbs the walls, you know, I don't know how else to describe it. People are like, Hey, is he really that, is he really that full of energy? I'm like, yes, he is. And he's awesome. I, I love every minute of it and, uh, I'll sleep later. So that's what I tell myself. So it'll, it'll all work out. My, my background in business, um, I've got a couple different businesses. Um, I've actually got six, so I'm only going to talk about really, um, really one today. Um, my, my stone co entity is kind of like my consulting, which, um, I don't do as much anymore. I do like business funding and startup investing and some of that out of there, some consulting still, but it's like $250 an hour, that kind of thing. I don't really, it's more for like helping people brainstorm and flesh out business ideas. And I, I'm kind of like their resource for that and connect them to my connections list. Funnel force is my, is my main focus. And I have, uh, that is that is in the software marketing space where we are basically creating lead generation softwares now for professionals on different platforms. So we have Lead Tether, which is just launched within the last 60 days, and that has gone bonkers. We've been received so well by the LinkedIn community. There's also um, some 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 companies that are kind of in the space that are transitioning and making a pivot, which is just making a wide opening for us. Um, we've got a software solution for uh, Facebook and the Meta Suite as far as auto prospecting is concerned, which is taking the place of another really big company that was forced to make a pivot and we actually are a third of the price of them. So as people are exiting that company, we're here with open arms, just like come to us, come to Funnel Force. We've got a software solution, you know, just for you that we launched last week. And we have onboarded <laughs> literally just because of this timing with this other business, we've we, we've started taking in more people than we even have with, with our Lead Tether launch. And it's not because Lead Tether's slow, it's just because of this other, you know, God, God's timing's perfect. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> Here you go. And I don't know how else to explain that. And then we have a smart CRM that's got AI built into it for companies looking to automate their PR, their social media. And they basically bring everything down into one place where they can manage their, their pipelines, their business management. We've got QuickBooks coded into it. Um, we've, got, we've got a bunch of stuff coded into it already. So there's a lot of stuff that people can save on subscription costs with. I, I, shouldn't, I, I don't want to be misleading. You, you have to still buy QUickBooks outside of this. It just yeah. integrates like flawlessly with it. Um, <clears throat> but there's a lot of other things you don't have to buy with it that we, we save people into the you know four digits a month <laughs> on the other subscriptions they'd be paying if they went through that. So that's what Funnel Force is. We are a hub for software solutions for entrepreneurs. And if you're anywhere between basically like, you know, half a million dollars a year gross revenue all the way up to about $15 million a year gross revenue, that's our sweet spot. Um, we can do bigger. We, we're actually in the process of onboarding a, a enterprise client uh, right now um, for, for Lead Tether, which by the time this episode comes out, that'll be done, which will, thank you, Jesus, that'll be awesome, the time to celebrate. But but we've got a lot of other things going on that we're, we're really excited about. So long-winded, I apologize, Sam. We'll no, flip good. it back to you. You're good. You're good. Um, one thing you said there like made me instantly think of a potential partnership between our organization. So we're going to talk after, <laughs> after this podcast. Let, awesome. Let's take it back a little bit. I always like to ask people, what were you doing before you became an entrepreneur? 
Oh man. So when I was in middle school, <clears throat> I was coming out of this phase where I got made fun of a lot as a kid and I was still getting made fun of, but I was like trying to figure out how to like not be the butt of the jokes. Mm -hmm. And I just got into really people watching and figuring out why I was such a dork and why I was getting made fun of. And I have pause right there for a second. Number yeah. one, kids are jerks. Number two, <laughs> I was having this conversation with somebody the other day. It's funny. The stuff that you get picked on about in middle school and high school is the same stuff that'll get you women past high school. Like, <laughs> insane how the adolescent brain works versus the adult brain. But go ahead. Right. Right. Absolutely. No, I mean, for me, like at the time I was, I was just, I grew up in a household that wasn't necessarily, my, it's not like my parents wanted me to eat junk food or anything, but I was like living on soda. You know, I go to friend's house. I mean, you know, like live on Twinkies and that kind of thing. Um, it wasn't like that 24 seven, but I was overweight. And, you know, I was, I was dealing with a lot of stuff in a lot of different regards where like I was getting picked on, but some of the stuff that was like really, um, really big at the time was I was trying to figure out how do I get out of this? And so I started like people watching and trying to figure out like, you know, how to, how to not, you know, basically the data that I was collecting at the time was I needed to, fitness was a big deal and some of these other things and I needed to not be such a weirdo and, you know, and so then I get into high school and then I start, you know, getting into like the drugs and I got into like selling drugs and I got into just basically being an entrepreneur that wasn't necessarily official or, or ethical. Let me, let me well, say I wasn't a good one. I wasn't even that successful at it. I, I had friends that were, but I just was wanted to be kind honestly, I piggybacked on their street credibility. Does that make sense? <laughs> what? I, always liked that. I, always I wasn't even a good entrepreneur. I just wanted to like, oh, he's a drug dealer. He's cool. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's why I did it. I've always said this and we do not condone this type of behavior, but a drug dealer is the OG entrepreneur. Like if you look at the business model of a drug dealer, Number one, when they're trying to get a new client, what do they do? They give their product away for free. Here's yeah. this little case to get you hooked. So they yeah. give you something for free, and then they come back to you later on. Hey, what'd you think? Oh, man, that was the bomb. Well, hey, if you want more, this is what I can do for you. Yeah. So, like the drug game, there are a lot of, again, don't make that your product. Right. There are a lot of salesmanship. Because if you're a drug dealer, you understand uh, communication. You understand supply and demand. Yeah. You understand uh, pricing. Like there's so many elements to that. So that's crazy. You're the first guest I've ever I've had on that's like, yeah. You don't look anything like your past. Number one, oh. you look like one of the most fit guys I've ever seen. Number two, <laughs> I can't imagine in my life a guy looking like you coming to me saying, hey, man, you want to buy some weed? Man, you know what's crazy? I was more into narcotics, and I had friends that sold cocaine, and, I, and 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 it was like it was it was it was ridiculous. Like a lot of the guys that I hung out with, they were like blowing Roxies before going out to parties, and like you know, bonging four locos is like the pregame, you know. And that, I mean, like it's like stuff that most people black out on. We were we were destroying our liver and our and our bodies and um that was you know that was a short fraction of my life life thank you jesus i got saved shortly thereafter like literally i found jesus like the fall of 2006 when i was you know 18 i was i was recently turned 18 and i was just like i was trying to get serious about life and business and when i started my first business at 18 years old i was like told my my business coach that i was trying to like learn from was like dude you got to clean your life up or i'm not going to help you and i was like okay I didn't get saved then. I didn't meet Jesus then, but I, I definitely, I, I quit the drugs, cold turkey. Like, I mean, there was no, there was no thing. And plus I'd already quit selling them by that point because I'd actually gotten a tip from <laughs> crazy story. I mean, this is really crazy, but like literally one of my friend's moms got a tip because she, she had a boyfriend that was on the drug task force unit that was like, yeah. look, your son has to stop hanging out with this Brentstone kid. And like, uh, like it named off like three other guys that were in kind of our, like our group. But because we ran underage parties like three nights a week, like keggers and the college kids would cross this little rinkety bridge in his backyard from like one of the housing complexes to our, to the yard that we were basically staying in. And like, we just, 
we charged covers and we would bring them in with the kegs they would pay like two buck covers dude we'd have a couple hundred people there and like they were buying like they were buying all the drugs they were like like we we made a profit doing it that way like we lured them in with like a two dollar cover for like yeah. free beer you know and then they bought all the other stuff and and, and it was it's terrible like i look back on it now and i'm just like oh my gosh God's grace kept me out of prison. I mean, for real, because they were they were actually collecting evidence on me and like two other guys to try us as adults once we turned 18. And this was like, I got this tip in November. <laughs> and my birthday was in February, just just to put it in perspective. Wow. They're like, anyway, God's rich in mercy and thank you for that. You know, there's just so much there, but I'll, uh, yeah, I just. That's anyway. a crazy story, man. All right, so after after the drugs, so uh, let's let's be clear and give honor where honors due. Did you drop the weight after finding Christ? No, I dropped the weight in high school. So when I went into my ninth grade year of high school, I quit drinking soda, and I started playing football. And the in, in the summer workouts leading up to the season, I lost about twenty five pounds. So like I was like one hundred and sixty. 158 pounds after I lost that I was I was I was like 180 pounds and then you know as a ninth grade kid yeah. lost all that and I would carry that weight around for years so like I was fast so I played like I didn't have good hands but I played tight end and I played defensive end because I was fast and I could go out for passes or I could rush the quarterback um, I wasn't like a skill player by any means and I didn't start so for what it's worth you know I, I did work hard and I was asked if I wanted to move up with some of the guys at the end of our, when our GB season ended that year to move mm -hmm. up to like varsity and do some of that. But it wasn't because I was skilled. It was because I had a good work ethic. And, yeah. um, anyway, so for what it's worth, you know, I, I had my, 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 my football then. And no, but know, leading up to that, like, you know, that's interesting that you were having all these entrepreneurial characteristics built into you and you didn't even realize it. Like sure. number one, and I've been, doing a lot of work on this and I'm on my own personal journey. Like I've been an athlete all through middle school and high school. And then COVID happened. We started having babies and the weight started. Coming. <laughs> um, I've gotten, first off, nobody ever tells you when you get your wife pregnant that you're also going to gain weight alongside. Her <laughs> if she wants the late night dairy cream, cream one. You can't look like oh, a jerk. Dude, you're definitely getting a butterfinger, butterfinger blizzard yeah. because like, how are you going to turn that down? You know what I mean? All day, all day. <laughs> so then like a couple friends started to say to me like, man, you're putting on a few pounds here and there, bro. Like, I was like, whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm back on my journey with that. But I uh, was talking to somebody the other day. It was actually one of the upcoming podcast episodes where people in business can typically – command the room a lot better and they're closing more deals when you physically take help take care of your health because somebody's looking that. at you saying if that guy pays that much attention to his health he's in there working out he's putting the right foods in his body that's somebody i can trust with my business because if you're willing to take the time to deal with those details in your life it's going to translate into the business world and then the drug game for whatever it is like just hearing you talk about putting on the party, like, dude, that is an entrepreneur to the core. Like, <laughs> hey, because that, that's some deep thinking for a high school student. To I mean, not only I can't take all that credit. I had about two or three other buddies. We all cooked. It was a mastermind. It was like a business oh, I mastermind. <laughs> I got you. But still, like the thought process of, hey, we're not going to make our money on the front end where we're charging two bucks for people to get in. It was here. a value ladder. Yeah. <laughs> where the real ROI is going to be is once we get them in the room. Then we can upsell them on. So, dude, you had all this worked out in your head. So at this point, you didn't realize that you were doing anything on the entrepreneurial level at all. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So totally. following the drug game, you you were able to escape uh, the uh, the CIA and the FBI <laughs> coming down on you. We weren't that big, you. but I, I definitely think I would have gotten prison time at least. I mean, at least a couple of years. I mean, I don't know what evidence they had or didn't have because literally – God, God protected me, shielded me. I, I literally stopped distributing. But then by the time like December, January came around, I would still go to parties, but like I was just like not doing stuff around where I typically did the, the stuff that I did. I still used, yep. but I wasn't like blatantly using in public and that kind of stuff. I like really, I kept it down. Then I got, I started my first business in March. 
And I never heard anything out of law enforcement after. Like I, no one, no one, I didn't get tailed. I drove, I drove a lime green Honda Civic that had a house of color, $3,000 paint job. I didn't pay for it. I bought the car that way. Had a carbon fiber hood, 18 inch wheels. It looked like Brian's Eclipse off the first Fast and the Furious. And I had the same engine yep. management, like flip up display. The sound system definitely cost more than the car. I could, you know, I was really proud of that. Like it was most ridiculous setup. So it wasn't like they couldn't find me. <laughs> like, like I was, Harrisonburg's 50,000 people. It's not like, you know, so like yeah. for whatever happened, like tell me that's not God. Like, I just, I don't know. No. Like, I mean. A thousand percent. Yeah. I had some situations like that. Nothing on that level, but there were definitely some times in college where I, my butt should have been in jail. Oh man. And, I mean, think about how much different your life would be today. Oh, if things are going in that direction, man. So yeah. you found a mentor. He told you he's not going to work with you until you get your life right. You start a business up in March. What was that business? Uh, so that was my network marketing business. I started the Amway business at the time. It was called Quick Start because Amway changed the name for like a short couple of years in there. But it was yeah. Amway network marketing business. And I'll tell you, Sam. Um, you and I have connected a little bit on our, on our history here. That business taught me more about just networking and sales than even some of my sales jobs. Cause at the time yeah. I had to work other jobs to fund my business. I was still in high school. So I would get up in the morning and I would wash dishes at a local diner at like my, my, my dad, God bless him. My parents are awesome. My dad gave me a ride at like four 30 in the morning to go Ooh. to a diner, wash dishes to make, you know, $6 and a quarter an hour. It probably would have been more profitable for my dad just to pay me the money and him sleep in than yeah. to like, you know, like he, my dad was an entrepreneur. He, he owned a business, you know, like he, he was working the hard hours anyway. And then he was going to do that for me. Like, man, my dad was awesome. Anyway. I was making $6 and a quarter an hour to wash dishes. And then I got promoted to be, you know, line cook and I did this stuff, but I was doing it early in the morning. Then I would go to school. I had a buddy pick me up from the diner, you know, on the way into school. And then I would do football. And then after football practice on, during football season, cause out, out of season, I would just go right to work. And this is high, wait, wait, hold on. This is high school. Yeah. This is high school. Yeah. Dude, the work ethic right there. <laughs> First off, I, I don't think you could pay most high schools a hundred bucks to wake up at four o'clock in the morning. It wasn't every day. I will say it wasn't every day. It was probably like three days a week during the week. And then I have like a Saturday morning shift. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, probably can, you probably can pay a high school a thousand bucks a month to wake up at 4 a.m. One day a month. <laughs> <laughs> so the work, and this is the core of what I'm trying to get to is that entrepreneurs aren't made, they're born. <laughs> yeah. But, you have, this is in your gut. Like if you become an entrepreneur, there's some element in your past that led you to where you are today. Because I truly believe entrepreneurs aren't, aren't made, they're born. It's just a part of our DNA that we have in us. So you're yeah. getting up 4 a.m. to go wash dishes, go to school, football practice, rinse and repeat every day. Um, were you outside of uh, Quickstar? Were you so you're like 17 at this point? So basically, I got done with the uh, the diner um, probably fall like of 2005. I started a job at busing tables at Outback Steakhouse around December 2005, and then I one of my coworkers started talking to me about the idea. He was a bus boy as well, and he talked to me about the idea probably in like February, and it took me like two weeks to get on this dude's calendar that he was working with. And that guy ended up becoming, um, the guy that he put me in touch with became my business coach. And, uh, that was, that was awesome because that guy taught me everything. Right. And, um, I mean, not just, not even just in like business, but he was, he was teaching me like, Hey, you straighten your life up. Like basically I'm not going to help you unless you straighten your life up. There's a lot of good things that came out of that. Plus taught me uh, how to build on my work ethic and structure my time, time management skill, mm -hmm. Um, but really to get over myself, I was fine talking to you. If you're my best friend, man, I spent hours in my car trying to decide if I was going to get out of my car and walk into Barnes and Noble and just start up one conversation. I was terrified. Oh, dude, I was terrified. Right, so, but then I, all right. So for those, yeah. so those people who aren't familiar with Amway, quick start network marketing, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. One, I will tell you the script and the model hasn't changed one bit <laughs> since me and Brent have been out of this. <laughs> Because the second I'm in Walmart, I remember I was like, where was I flying to? I think I was flying to Atlanta or something. So the night before I'm at Walmart getting like all the, you know, miniature toothpaste and deodorants and all that stuff. The guy walks up to me and he's like, man, you look real familiar. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah? Quick talk. Quick talk. 
I feel you. <laughs> like, so the script hasn't changed at all. But to your point, um, probably one of the most valuable lessons I got that changed my life for my mentor and, and Quickstar was he told me to, because at the time, and Quickstar is a big system where you're seeing all these married people, you're seeing all these couples, you're seeing all these relationships. So if you're a single guy in the system, it's almost like, you know, we rarely, we never see a president that's single. Like they're always married. So it was like that kind of thing where it was like, you haven't completed everything until you put a ring on somebody's finger and you're doing this as a team moving forward. So you're always looking for those things. So I'm one of the single guys in the group. Sure. And my mentor gives me some of the best advice ever. He says, Sam, this is what you need to do. You need to sit down with a pen and paper. And he's like, don't, like try to keep this in your head, write this down on paper. Cause there's something magical that happens here. And I want you to write out every quality characteristic of your ideal mate. Mm, that's write good. Yeah. And the list was probably, I mean, I got pretty in depth. I think the list was about 45 things on my list. And some of that's, you know, the physical stuff, but it's more like who the person is. Yeah. yeah. And ultimately what that does when you create that list it shows you the type of person that you need to be in order to attract that person into your life. So like, if you're like, if you're making your list and you're like, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to marry a woman who smokes, but you're smoking 12 packs a day where well, you're not going to attract a person who doesn't smoke. If you're smoking 12 packs a day, yeah. so there's all these things. And ultimately, so I made that list probably when I was 22, somewhere around there. And I kid you not, my wife hits 95% of everything I had on that list that never, it was years later, like 10 years later before we met. Um, but that list that I wrote put things in motion, allowed me to become the man I needed to be to attract a woman like that into my life. And I believe it's the same with everything across the board, whether it's your business, writing out your goal, because then you can see if this is what I'm trying to accomplish, let me work backwards from this. What is it that I need to do in order to complete this? A thousand percent. So, yeah, the skills that you get in network marketing, in particular, uh, Amway and Quickstar, was in value. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You made you made a lot more money in that system than I did. I, I didn't see nothing. I was still sleeping in bathtubs at <laughs> conferences. And you know, it, it, was, it was a really cool system. Like, I came in at such an impressionable age, Sam. Like, I... I came in at an age Same. where I, 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 it's not that I believed it more than like you or other people. I just, what I did is I just something, I don't know if it was like one of the giftings God gave me or if I, I don't know. I was tired of going to bed hungry. Like, cause, cause I, here's what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to keep calling my parents after I left home and being like, Hey, I need a bailout because number one, they wouldn't have done it anyway. But two, I wanted to show them that I made a good decision because before I signed the dotted line, I told my dad I was going to do this. And we got into this like yelling match about how network marketing was in a real business. And I told him I was going to be successful. And he, mind you, he had his own company that was valued pretty high back in like the mid 2000s. He had a master's in business, a PhD in business. He like did all this stuff the academic route and put it, he didn't know what he was talking he, about. He didn't know and he he put it into practice. He had, you know, 55 employees at his computer company, software distribution company, all this stuff. And I'm like that, like, I respect everything that you've done, but network marketing is a real business. Like you just haven't seen what I've seen. Right. Right. You, 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 you with me. And so he's like, he's like, Whatever. And, and so we got into this yelling match and I, and I, and I'm so like embarrassed to even say this now because my dad's awesome. You know, he put up with so much junk that I gave him in high school and they didn't know about like 75% of the bad stuff that I was doing. And they found out about it after they heard me on like talks. Cause I have like CDs and MP3s out in the education system about like my background now. And they're so proud of me now, but like at the time they didn't know, they, yeah. they, they didn't think I was going to do anything with my life. Cause all they saw was this punk kid that blared bass you know rap you know rap music in their you know little suburban neighborhood at 2 a.m when i'd come home from parties smelling like cigarettes and alcohol and everything else they were like you're not gonna be successful in network marketing i'm like i i've changed and they're like right right yeah, okay. yeah college is your direction i'm like college ain't my direction and so like that's just how that went down and it was a lot a lot the volume of that was a lot higher if you get where i'm going i was just like i'm gonna make this work so i was like 
going to make this work. Plus, a lot of my friends were like, not to my face, but like, we're like, man, you, you know what Brent's doing? And I was like, I, I don't know if I grew up in a bubble. I had no idea what network marketing even meant, but everyone was like MLM, this and that. I'm like, what does that even mean? I'm, I started a business. Do you want to make extra money? And like, I just went down this, yeah. you know, I just went down this path and I literally, it took me like nine months to get over my thing of like talking to strangers because I was tired of sitting in my car four hours a night wasting time. And I just got to the point where I was so upset with myself. I just started going and talking to random people. I made like five contacts a day after that. And it wasn't like every day, but like I, I, I made time hours every day to go out and prospect. And, and I, yep. I just did it. And so I don't know, there's just a lot there. And eventually we put hundreds of people in business. And I think after like 18 months, I had like business in like 15 different states and um, I got recognized nationally at 18 year, uh, 18 months after I got started in business. And then after that, we, we hit, we grew even more. And so like, there's, there's some stuff I, what I'm not saying in there, which I will tell you is that I backslid my business after I qualified at a certain like nationally recognized level, I backslid in my yep. business. And, and when I was like 20 years old, I just burned out. After the two years of grinding hard, I burn out. And then I got my feet back underneath of me and I started going at it again, probably like a year later. Um, but I still went to meetings. I still did all the things that you're supposed to do, but I just totally burn out. And then, and then I got back into it and I did it smarter the next time. So one, let, let's stop on the prospect yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. Um, and number two, this is what I like about the format of the show. I did not expect the conversation going <laughs> in this direction, but I'm so glad that it did. Um, Number one, dude, I think we were separated. Right? <laughs> like, we may, we may not be the same skin tone, but like, there are so many similarities with our stories. I'm like, I, my mom got some explaining. Like, something, something happened. Like, I got separated from this guy at birth. Uh, but the prospecting thing, that is literally the person I interviewed for the podcast earlier today. She was a sales coach. And to me, that is probably the most valuable skill set that anybody can ever pick up. Because if you know how to sell something, you will never Man. go hungry a day. In your Amen. Life. And it's it's the when you're backed up against the wall, when guys who have strong guys or girls who have strong sales backgrounds, I'm sure you've experienced too, where there's weeks where like payrolls due and it ain't in the <laughs> bank. What you gonna do? You got three, four days to make this happen. And somehow or another. We always figure it out. But that prospecting piece with, uh, you know, MLM and, and Quickstar and things like that, that was probably my break, biggest breakthrough as an entrepreneur because that scared the living crap out of me going up to a stranger in the grocery store or the mall or Kroger or whatever and just striking up a conversation. Yeah. And the biggest fear of like this person just being like, I don't want to talk to you. Get away from me. <laughs> and when you realize like, huh. That's happened to me a few times and I haven't died yet. So like, yeah, this isn't that bad because it was often you'd get a few no's and then the next person you talk to was like so excited to talk to you and they're coming to the meeting next week and they're bringing two friends, like all that stuff. Um, so it's interesting to see that because you skipped college, yeah. but you only went to college in business, the school, the, of, the school of lead generation, oh, because that's God. what it was. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like. And you got more of an education there than you ever would have gotten going to a four year yeah. university. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've got some friends that have some fancy degrees and, and I, and I can appreciate some of that. And <clears throat> I've learned like, this is, this is, this is a tough topic for me because I never want to be offensive to people that like really put a lot of weight yeah. on investing in education and all of that. Because there's, listen, I want, I want my surgeon that operates on me to like, have been uh, summa cum laude, you know, 4.3 GPA. Like I want them to know exactly what they're doing, but yeah, I don't want my surgeon studying on YouTube, but like if I'm going to, you know, if I need someone to organize like all my like audio video stuff, I'm, I'm calling you because like you, you, you the entrepreneur nature, you've investigated every avenue of how to put together all the things that I need. If you're solving my problem, I already know, even if you were a, a yeah. D plus student or a C minus student, that the entrepreneur has figured out all of the things that can go wrong. And they've basically created a solution for the client. 
because they yep. can't hang their hat. They can't. And it doesn't matter if I have a degree. They, up on the they wall. can't hang their hat on a degree if they don't got it. So like, so I I gotta produce results somewhere for people. And if people look to a degree as a result, it's it's different than if you don't have that. So like, I don't have that. So we gotta produce. So I'll I'll say I'll say what you yeah. can. Majority of kids should not be oh, going man. to college. The value of a degree has completely diminished. Yeah. I do believe that there are certain professions where, like you said, a surgeon, uh, doctor, yeah. lawyer, teacher, you need to absolutely. A but for the majority of people, if you have an understanding of what field you want to go into, number one, get a paid education. So if that's not an internship, it's like starting at the ground level of a company that's in an industry that you yeah. want to be in. Start mopping the floor. Start working the mailroom. You're going to be made aware of the conversations and things that are going on and you're getting an education along the way. And at the same time, you're getting yeah. paid. I've even, I've even gone as far to say this, like I listed off those three professions of people that need to go to college. One of those I mentioned, you don't actually have to go to college. It's an attorney. What do you have to do to become an attorney? You just have to pass the bar. <laughs> you don't have to have a college. Now, granted, there's a movie about someone difficult. that did that. <laughs> Catch me if you can. <laughs> have you seen that? Oh, dang. I didn't yeah. think about the that. The dude passed the bar. I've said that a thousand yeah. times. He, he ran from the FBI oh, for yeah. so many years, faking his careers, and he just yep. learned along the way. He passed, the dude passed the bar. And people are like, oh, yep. if I'm going to be an attorney, i got to go to law school. Actually, you just have to be incredibly, yep. like, you have to be incredibly intelligent, of course, but, like, oh, if yeah. you're not going to go to law so school to not first. Go to college, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to not go to college and pass the bar, you basically have yeah, to be a yeah. But for everything, if you want to learn, I, 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 I would challenge somebody and I'd love to have somebody on the podcast talking about this. I bet somebody that's taking Spanish lessons on YouTube will learn the language much more effectively and quickly than if they took it. I took five years of Spanish throughout high school and college. And all I can say is Los Pantalones, El Gato, <laughs> Gracias. Like I got a few words. There's no way you could dump me off in Spain and I could yeah. survive. Um, but a person who can learn that information on their own, is, we're, we have access to all yeah. this stuff. They're probably going to learn Spanish at a much more efficient rate than someone that's being forced oh to my sit gosh. in a classroom. You, like, so I got my whole thing. Here, here's I'm going to give you yeah. my dream because me and you may end up. Yeah. <laughs> here's my dream of what university should look like. It should the same thing, because I believe the experience that you get in college and like you and I have talked, I dropped out of college at the junior level. Um, but the experience that I got from college, one, you're getting to figure yourself out, learn yourself. It's your first time out on your own. Um, you're going to let your hair down, get all the stupid stuff out the way that you can so that you can finally be an adult. I think it's great for that. The networking. My first four business partners were all guys that I met in college. So the relationships that I got there. But Here's how I envision college in the future. Remove the lecture hall. No more classes. And everything is just based on internships. So let's say in a six hour period, Monday through Friday, you have classes. Instead of classes, you're going to internships. But everything else is still the same. You still got frats. You still got sororities. You still got dorm halls. You still go eat at the D hall. You got all these student body councils. You got all that stuff. Just remove the classroom and insert Dude, internships. And I We should start that university. We should start it. Dude, at the end of a four year experience, there is no doubt in a student's mind exactly what they want to do, because you've tried a variety of so many yeah. different things that by the time it gets to graduation, you are not only do you already know what you want to do, you're probably already being primed by the business that you want to go work for. Because well, you you so. totally so. decrease the on ramp training time period for a business, which decreases their overhead. You come in as a twelve dollar an hour intern or whatever the minimum going rate is for an intern now. You know, if if you're bringing a college kid in yeah. to work for you, basically they're already trained. You can just boop. I mean, put them in payroll. I mean, I guess they're probably already in payroll if you're paying them as an as a paid internship. Yep. Like, there's no there's no on ramp, and so you're saving mm -hmm. your first three weeks of just them. 
I mean, people can say what they want. Someone's worthless starting a new job for the first four weeks. I mean, say what you want. Like, Absolutely. like pe- people are like, no, Absolutely. that's not true. They, you know, I'm like, look to the business as far as cash flow is concerned, they're worthless. I, now, as a, as a, yeah, because I'm having to put so much in the training and all this stuff that we're taking. Are they a human? Cash. Am I a Christian? Do I love people? Yes, but like at the end of the day, the business is taking a risk hiring somebody. My wife is basically acting CEO and CEO of our healthcare. We have a dental company corporation and literally we, she had a girl, we, we, we were like four staff members down for a long time. She hired multiple people for these positions. Th- this year has been wild. It's like this post COVID weird people. First off, this year has felt like eight months already. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly, I agree with that. That That's absolutely a fact. Let me, let me tell you this. This girl shows up and like like a week into the job, two weeks into the job, she just doesn't like show back up again. Like so people are like, businesses can just afford to hire random people and this and that. I'm like, you know how much time and energy she put into training someone when she's already like all this other outgo and loss of production because we're down staff members and all this stuff. Yep. It is absolutely a risk for a business to hire people. Like Anyway, sorry to get on the soapbox, but it's just like it's it's just oh, no, crazy. No, no, like uh, to 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 hire an employee, not not to to train and onboard an employee, it costs someone. I used to do recruitment specific advertising when I was in the advertising business. I learned this from a guy that has sold hundreds of millions of dollars of recruitment services out of Florida. I'm trying to think of this guy's name. Oh man, it's going to come to me. Anyway, he literally talked about the cost involved. And this was like backed by like data from like some of these big research companies. If someone, let's say you pay someone 30 grand a year, because that's not like, that's not even like a real number anymore. But like, let's say back, you know, in the mid 2000s, when like $30,000 a year was like a, you know, like a good income or whatever, part-time income or whatever. So like you're hiring a college student for 30 grand right out of college, or let's call it 40,000. Okay. Like you multiply like that by a fraction and the fraction was like, you know, 0.25. 0.25. And it was like, you take that number. Well, okay. So there's 10 grand. So it's going to cost you $10,000 in downtime resources to hire them, advertising, basically get them in the door. Like you factor all the stuff in, it costs you money to hire that person and train them. Then you're also, oh yeah, yep. you're paying them. And you may lose clients oh, in the process. That person is just starting if they have direct contact with Dude, the clients yeah. and, lose and and people are just like, well, yeah, but it's a business. They got money. And it's like, that's such the wrong mindset to have. Like if you want the little guys to win, yeah. you, you got to like make it a little bit more incentivizing for these little guys to stay in business. Cause it's like, now it's like, people are like <laughs> raising the minimum wage. and doing all that. I'm like, you do realize that's going to like negatively impact business. Sorry. I'm like going off on like these tangents that probably don't even. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm with this because then when we have to increase our prices and clients are complaining about price, who can afford that? Well, I can't yeah. afford to charge less. Yeah. Like what the yeah. overhead is. And a lot of people just don't, first off, if, if, if you're listening to this right now and you walk past an entrepreneur, yeah. just hug them, give them a kiss. Yeah. They need some love. We, we go through, we go through a lot. A lot people just don't realize. Cause I remember like when I first became an entrepreneur, like maybe two, three months in business, people think I'm oh, rolling man. in the dough. They just hear a business owner or entrepreneur and they're like, Oh, Sam's loaded now, bruh. I'm making 30% less than oh, what I was making in corporate totally. America. And that's that's after I got things like rolling, and and with um, more, more responsibility, so with more responsibility up. load, yeah. So you're stressed to the max. You're making less, and everyone's like, "Oh, you're loaded. You can afford." To, and I'm just like, "Gosh, like, yeah, just go run a business, yeah. like, or go work food service, go work as a server, then go start a business, because then you got your customer service skills, and then go start a business. <laughs> go try to get a loan when you've yeah. got no income to start a business. Like all these things, people think they just take for granted when they go and apply at your business." Mm-hmm. But this this brings us back full circle to what yeah. we were saying at the beginning. Entrepreneurs are born. They're not made because what idiot <laughs> like us would say, hey, I'm going to give up working for this guy for 40 hours as a nice, strong salary, health benefits, 401k. And I'm going to go out and do this on my own. I'm going to take on more stress. I'm going to double the amount of time that I have to work. I'm going to work for 80 percent <laughs> less than what I was making before. And I'm going to do it with a smile on my face. Yeah, that sounds like a great life. Right. We are maniacs, dude. Any anybody who signs up for entrepreneurship. Yeah, we are crazy. We just are. But at the same token, 
We wouldn't no. have it any other way. <clears throat> no, we wouldn't. This this is not the life we chose. This <laughs> life chose us. So I often spend a lot of time talking people out of entrepreneurship because they're like, man, like I, I want to do what you do. My first yeah. question is why? Okay. Now we got your why. What are you willing to give up to do it? Are you willing to sleep in your car? Are you willing to go into debt? Are you willing to lose friends? Are you willing to like kill your social life for the next two years? Like, are you willing to do all this? Because these are all the things it takes. And then even after doing all there's that, there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee that you're going to make it. Man, you want to hear one of the, the best quotes I've ever heard? It's kind of like right in line with what you're saying. All right. So yeah. it was like this, like this meme. And it was like this guy, this mechanic working on this Rolls Royce engine. And it was like, it was obviously a Rolls Royce engine. It was like, you know, like a, like a, a V12 out of a phantom or something like this. And the guys like the mechanics in there and, you know, also, you know, the mechanics in like a collar, you know, like a white collar doing this. And it's like, listen, you're not paying me $350 an hour, um, based upon me doing your oil change. You're paying me $350 an hour because I spent 30 years working on Rolls Royces to work on your Rolls Royce. Cause exactly. I guarantee you, you can go pay someone a lot less than $800 for the oil change or $1,200 for the oil change. If you go down to Jiffy Lube, the only problem is they might jack up your Rolls Royce. Uh, yeah. And then you're going to have $20,000 worth of repairs that you're going to have to make because you didn't want to spend uh, Yeah, per hour. And then here's the thing. And, and what people don't understand is like you're not paying that because they're price gouging you. They're actually saving you money because of their expertise. You, you, you invest with the service you need to solve your problem so that you don't have bigger problems later. And that's what a lot of entrepreneurship has taught me over the years. And it's like, that's why someone would want to come to you. It's like, you've got the expertise. It's kind of like what I was saying earlier. It's like, you've investigated all the, all the things that could go wrong around solving this mm -hmm. client's problem, you know, with Enzo media. And it's like, you, you, you have that stuff figured out. So like, that's, that's the big thing where, where people don't, yep. they don't appreciate it because it's not like we're hanging our hat on a degree. It's not like we're hanging our hat on some type of big name. It's like, pe oh gosh, this is another thing too. When you're doing sales for a big company, like I was out, I was um, snowboarding or skiing out in Seamboat, Colorado, like last fall. Um, I say fall because around here there's mm -hmm. no snow, but out in Colorado there is. And uh, so actually, no, this was, yeah sorry, about a year ago, this time, maybe last year. And i rode this lift up with a Red Bull sales rep. <clears throat> and I'm like, that's pretty cool. You know, you sell energy drinks. And I'm like, I sold energy drinks because excess with Amway and quick and all that. But it was way yeah. different because <laughs> nobody liked that. I mean, I mean, the drinks tasted good, but people weren't like excited about that. But you know what? When you're spending all this branding power as a corporation to brand the product. Well, man, when you show up at a party and you're holding a Red Bull, well, that's cool because everyone's programmed. But when you're trying to represent your own thing, like me walking around with an excess, people are like, man, you weirdo. Like, why do you have that? And I'm like, it's my business. And as an entrepreneur, when you're starting your own yep. thing, you have to have enough guts to go out there by yourself and like hold your can up of whatever and say, this is me. And a lot of people, that's why that, that's, that keeps a lot of people from being an entrepreneur. It's like, People like tell me, oh, Funnel Force, that's a cool name for a business. And uh, sure. But like, but like, honestly, like I didn't know if that was going to be received well when Glenn and I came up with the name for that, you know, for our, for our, for that company. Like, I was like hoping that it was going to be cool. Like we put yeah. people into your sales funnel, you know, like whatever, but, but like people, I, I, I was rolling the dice. Like literally I'm like, I'm going to, and then I'm going to back it up. I got to, with a smile on my face and a straight face say, Hey, I'd like to serve you with our Funnel Force services and do all this stuff. And People just don't get it. Yeah. And name names don't matter sure, when it sure, comes sure. to starting a company. Because you think of something like, what did Google mean before right. Google exactly. gave it meaning? What was what was Exxon right. before Exxon? Like those names mean absolutely nothing until you add value in it. I got a story to attach to to what you said in terms of like you're sure. paying somebody for their experience. So I remember this was me and my wife's first home. Uh, we built a brand new condo from the ground up, um, all brand new appliances, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're maybe in the house for a year and a half, two years. And these are the new washing machines where like, yeah. you just push buttons. Like it's not knobs and stuff like that. Like you just push buttons. So one day, I guess I thought I was the incredible Hulk. I went to start the washing machine and I pushed it way too hard. And the button went like all the way in on the machine. So then I'm like, I'm an entrepreneur. I'll figure this out. Let me go to YouTube. And I go to YouTube and then it's like, uh, yeah, detach this from the motherboard and do X. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. washing machines have motherboards now. I was like, I'm I'm not about to do this. Let me call the guy. So I do a quick Google search. 
find a guy who can who can come help me out. Uh, arrives to my house promptly. Um, I show him where the washer washing machine is, and I'm like, "Hey, man, here it is. Here's the problem. I'm going downstairs to watch TV. Just give me a holler when you're done." Um, I go downstairs. I think there was like some basketball or football game on, and I'm just sitting there chilling, thinking, you know, maybe by halftime or something like that, the guy will call me back up there. Five minutes goes by. Hey, Mr. Anderson, I'm done. So I walk upstairs, and he's like, yeah, here was your problem. You know, you had to do this, and blah, 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 I did this. We're good to go. Uh, that's 75 bucks. Cool. Wrote him wrote him a check or venmo him, whatever it was. Um, went in the bedroom and told my wife, hey, repair guy fixed the washing machine like he's done already. And she looked at me, she's like, already? He just got here. I was like, yeah, well, he fixed the problem. She was like, how much you pay him? I said, 75 bucks. She said, you paid him 75 bucks to work for five minutes? I said, no, that's not what I did at all. I paid him. We had a problem. I paid him to provide me with the solution. He did it. He did it. Does that, should I pay him more money if it takes him three hours to fix our washing machine versus five minutes? Actually, I appreciate him more the fact that uh, he wasn't disturbing my Sunday afternoon when I'm trying to watch the Pittsburgh Steelers yeah. kill on the field. And this guy was in and out, paid him 75 That's bucks awesome. and moved on. So, that is such a crucial thing where entrepreneurs have to understand you get yeah. paid off of your experience. The longer you've been in this industry, the better you get, it should require more money. So one, and this is something I think we all struggle with. I personally struggle with it, um, is raising your prices. Every time I've raised my prices, there's been this little <laughs> devil on my shoulder saying, nah, I don't know. Like, you know, you're going up, you're going to lose some clients. People aren't going to, you know, spend as much money with you, blah, blah, blah. Every single time I've increased prices, not only has that led to an influx of clients, but it's led to an yeah. influx of better clients. The higher my price points have got, the less dumb phone calls I get from people complaining about something. Because the people that I give discounted prices to are calling and complaining about oh, yeah. every little thing. The clients that I charge the most money to thousands per month that we charge them. Yeah. Never hear from them. And then, they're and then you know why? The because they know yeah. they're paying a premium for you to handle their problems. They're, they're not worried about micromanaging. They're not worried about the little things. I mean, like, I don't know if you, if you follow Alex Hormozzi at all. I like his stuff. Dude, he, he, talk, he oh, yeah. talks about, yep. in, um, not how $100 million leads, but in $100 million offers, he's like, charge as much money as you can so you feel good about fulfilling the service you'll give better customer service and your customers will tell other people about the experience because you can afford to give them the experience you cut your if you cut your wrists Absolutely. on trying to give the lowest price not only are you going to go out of business but you're going to hate fulfilling for your client and people like i, I heard grant cardone say this too i'm not like here's the thing like grant cardone said uh Oh gosh. Oh, what was it? It was, it was so good. It was like, literally like you want to charge so you can make money because it's benefiting not only me as, as the person selling the service, but you have buy-in as a client. Yep. And actually I learned that, I learned that even before grant, like that was, that was an, that was an Amway thing. Like basically. Oh yeah. Cause if you get, if you give something <clears throat> oh away gosh, for yeah. free, people don't value, like put on an event right yeah. now and make it free. There are a bunch and of people that are RSVP and sign up and then the actual yeah. date comes. They're not going to show up, but just charge five bucks for that event per ticket and people will have a conundrum. They'll say, oh, you know what, man, I really don't feel like going this, thing. but you know what? I did pay a few bucks. <laughs> so it'd be, it'd be foolish Absolutely. of me not to go. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, that mentality of just when you're looking at that level of client, it is yeah. drastically changed my business because when you're charging too little for your service, I will tell you the biggest thing that it does for the entrepreneur. Hate is the wrong word. You begin to, yeah. you have disdain for that client. Like, because you realize the work that you're putting into it is not the amount that they paid you. So you're just bitter at the fact that somebody got over you and you're having to do all this work and you're not yeah. making the type of money that you want to make. But when you set those prices, when you set a standard, the level of clientele that starts yeah. to come your way is just insane because they do value your opinion. Like if somebody's paying me three grand a month, you better oh, yeah. believe they're listening to what I have to say. If I was charging 300 bucks a month, they probably feel like they know more than me, but they don't feel like dealing with all the little details and they'd rather just have a minion that they no. can direct. That's not no. the business I'm in. 
if you hire me and I'll fire a client, if you're not going to take heed, and I'm not saying I know it all, yeah. but you hired us for a reason. And if you're not willing to follow the game plan and the strategy that my team has set for you, we're yeah. not, we're not the company you no. need to be working. Loud and clear. And that is one of the most powerful things that you can do as an entrepreneur is firing a client. I'm not saying look, <laughs> look to do that. Don't go down your list right now and be like, who can I fire? But if you're dealing with someone and this whole reason I got into entrepreneurship is because I hated working yeah. with people that I didn't like. And I said, when I became an entrepreneur, I'm only going to work yeah. with people that I want to be around. That goes for employees. That goes for clients. That goes for partners. I, I mean, like but that's it, just good I'm for your like. Way. I mean, t- truly, it's good for like your your overall well being because then you get to love what you do versus like being, sh- you know, hey, this is a client list. Now you're you're handling this force at a major corporation. We're just going to shove this client list down your throat. You got to service everyone on the list. This is your territory. This is your list. This is yep. your X Y Z. You got to you got to manage it now. Now. You don't have to do that. It's like, as an entrepreneur, you're just like, okay, well, I'm going to work really hard. And the stages are, it's like, I'm going to work really hard, get paid nothing. I'm going to work really hard. And then I'm going to like start getting paid, but I'm going to like have to, you know, like work into this and learn my skill set. Then as you start getting that experience, it's like, then you start raising your prices and then you just keep raising them until you get the level of clients you want. 